Well, hello everybody. Glad you all are here this morning with us and provoke and starting off your day right and upping your leadership skills here. So thanks for being here. Um, Wendy, Wendy and Scott and Zach and Marty and Pete and Ann. I think I got everybody. We are so glad you're here. That's our team. Um, so thanks for joining us. We know it's early, but um, as Wendy was saying earlier, we now have the sun with us. So that makes it better, right? <laughs> It's amazing. It's amazing. So um, if you are not getting uh, emails or reminders, you can go to provokedayton.com and you can sign up for those. You can just scroll to the bottom of the page and put those, uh, add your name to that if you want. And, um, and you can either get a text reminder, you can do an email reminder, and we send out the slides and all the information that we have for the provoke for the month. So um, you can make sure and get those and you want to sign up. So you can either go to that site and do that, or you can put it in the chat as well. You can put your email there and, or your phone number if you want to text and uh, we'll make sure and add you to that, whatever's easiest for you to do that. And we will send these slides out just so everybody's, you know, we give you a lot of information. So we want to make sure and give those to you as well. So we'll send that out. Marty last month started a contact networking sheet and that's just for if you'd like to network with some people in Provoke, um, let other people know what business you're in, what organization you're with, that type of thing, so that you can get together with other leaders, then you can put in the chat your name and your organization and your contact information. And we've got a sheet of people and we'll send that out as well for the month. Uh, Marty, is there anything else with that? No, in fact, I'll put mine in as kind of an example and they can just follow my template. Okay, sounds great. Thanks. Just want to make sure and do that. Okay, every year we host the Global Leadership Summit at Southbrook, and it is in August. It's August 5th and 6th, and it is an amazing leadership conference. This conference, um, it's two days, and it just fills me up for the year. It really does. It kind of, it gives me so much leadership information and ideas and um, you know, kind of direction for where I'm really going to go for the new year. So uh, that is the Global Leadership Summit. You can go to uh, Dayton or I'm sorry, glsdayton.com to sign up for that. And again, that's on August 5th and 6th, and it's going to be live and digital. So you can do either one you want there and then um, sign up for that. Bud Hauser is one of the directors for GLS at Southbrook. So Bud, do you want to add any information to that? Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, those of you that are familiar with, thank you, Kathy, uh, uh, understand what it is. And I'll do just a brief review for those that are not. I will make one correction to what Kathy said. The website is DaytonGLS.com. I always the other mix way that around. up. And I... <laughs> DaytonGLS.com. Thanks. See that. Um, I think I said. Hey, bud, you're muted. Hey, bud, you're muted. <laughs> hey, bud. He can lost the sound a bit. <laughs> hey, Kathy, why Bud's, why Bud's trying to find his mute button? This is Ty. Um, <laughs> just to back up what Bud's saying, we are also looking for volunteers to help out with that as well, too. So if those that want to both see some of it and help participate with it. We're always looking for volunteers. Um, I don't have the website available for that off, off hand, but if you get with Bud or anybody on the GLS team, they can direct you to um, helping out and volunteering. We have many, many different uh, opportunities with them to volunteer to, do, to help out. Awesome. Bud, you back in? Bud, you're muted again. Keeps me turning itself on there. I, there you go. I actually, I've had it on twice, so it keeps turning itself off, so I'll watch it. Anyway, um, as Kathy said, the Global Leadership uh, Summit is uh, faith-based. It's a leadership development and collaboration opportunity where you can uh, actually ignite transformation within your city, within your company, within your team, or accelerate uh, 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 transformation that's already underway. And uh, just a little background for those of you that may not be familiar, it's the Global Leadership Summit, which will abbreviate to GLS. It's hosted by the Global Leadership Network out of Chicago. 
and Southbrook is uh, one of 500 sites in the U.S. and Canada that are going to be offering it, as Kathy said, both live and, and uh, digitally online, if you prefer that, you'll have your choice. And uh, if you do sign up for the Leadership Summit, you'll have access to all the sessions uh, up to seven days afterwards online on demand. So I want you to think about the rational approaches as head approaches, right? They're really gonna kind of go towards head, uh, an appeal to the head. Now, and I, and I also wanna engage you all in this. So I want you to think about, um, let's assume that we all are gonna take on the role to influence someone to attend the GLS. That's our task, okay? That's who we're, as influencers in this community, that's what we're trying to do, all right? So one approach we could take, we could choose from these set of rational approaches, All right? So the logical persuading is very much about giving facts and logic to explain what you believe. Now you can read the other things on the, on the uh, slide here. So I'm not gonna go into these, but this is very frequent. We frequently use this. So um, Bud actually used this approach when he was talking about GLS. So a couple of things that Bud said, because this is about facts and evidence, facts and evidence to support our position, right? So Bud was saying, I really think you should think about coming. It's faith-based, it accelerates transformation. Um, if, you, if you sign up, you get access to all the sessions. And then there was a really powerful piece of data, in fact, that he used around Southbrook. If you go through Southbrook, what was it? What was the fact that Bud shared if you sign up through Southbrook, money, <laughs> right? It'll be $99, All right? So great job, bud, right? And really like being logical and persuasion. But let me ask someone else to come off and say, if you were gonna use this approach to describe to someone why they should come to GLS, what might be something that you would share in addition to what we've already heard? On, folks, you're killing me here. <laughs> I think you could, I would share my previous experience and what I took away from it. Absolutely. Right. So it's like, here's my belief that was so powerful because I was able to take this away from it. Right. Beautiful. Okay. So again, this is about facts and evidence to support our position. If our position is we want you to come, we're going to provide facts and evidence, value, that kind of thing. All right. Legitimizing. This is about, um, Referring to a source of authority is how I'm going to describe this. That source of authority could be a person, an institution, a title, a rank. Um, and it, it works some, some of the time, um, but it's usually combined with other approaches. It doesn't really sit on its own very well, but it could be very powerful in conjunction with others. So if we go here, this is one way that GLS is legitimizing this experience. Why is this a legitimizing technique? What do you think? This is a way they're trying to influence us to come. If someone that important is speaking, it must be you know, it, worth my time. It must be legit, right? <laughs> It must be good. So legitimizing is often about, you will hear people reference names, institutions, well-known um, people, you know, as a way to get people to, to influence someone, right? So that's, that's another way in which GLS is saying, hey, we're trying to legitimize this. All right, let's go to the third one. Again, these are all head, right? And let me just say the first two, logical persuading and legitimizing are all in service of, let me explain why this would be good, right? Let me explain. These two, exchanging and stating are, are like, more like, believe me, believe me, okay? So exchanging is about, we'll call this give and take, negotiation, bartering, um, bargaining, you know, to get somebody to come, right? So we're negotiating or, or trading for something, okay? So this could be, for example, um, and I'm going to ask 
Um, who was talking to us about the volunteers? I'm sorry. Who was? Who was? That was me. Uh, Okay, Ty. So I'm going to ask you because I think I think we could really take that. So let's say we're trying to influence someone to be a volunteer, to be a volunteer. So Ty, I'm going to ask you to think about what would you, how would you use exchanging as an influence technique that might influence someone to be a volunteer? For those who want to spend a couple hours of volunteering their time, they can get the full impact of the GLS opportunity. Yeah. Um, for for giving up just a couple hours of their time beautiful beautiful right it's like hey this is what you're gonna get by giving this right it's a given it's a give and get give and take kind of thing beautiful thank you very much yep um the last one is stating it's just making an assertion about your point of view <clears throat> and what you want someone to believe or, or accept right so it could be as basic as you have to come it's going to change your life just stating Stating something that we believe to be true. Um, we can overuse this, uh, but it can be really effective when you're really confident in your ideas. Right? And I think, um, you know, Bud expressed a lot of confidence around the value of GLS. So we really saw stating from him from that perspective. Okay. So again, take a look at these. Identify which of these you think you tend to lean on. You know, which, which do you think you tend to use more often than not? <clears throat> Let me pause and see if anybody has any questions or reflections before we go to the next group. I don't think I heard a question, so. Unless I miss something, I'm gonna go ahead and, and move to the next round. Make sense? Okay. Now we're gonna to go to the social approaches. Okay. So we have socializing and appealing to relationships. This is where we look at really finding common ground through these two approaches, all right? Socializing is when, um, it's when we don't know someone very well. Uh, and we are influencing by um, establishing a connection, finding shared experiences, finding similarities, being friendly, being open. Um, so let's say you're approaching someone that you really don't know very well and you wanna influence them to come to GLS. Um, how might you use this approach? What might this look like? And you all know me, I'm just gonna start calling on people. <laughs> so get ready. All right, let's see, Marty, I'm gonna ask you to think about what do you think you might do with socializing as a way to find common ground to influence someone? I think I would find out how interested they are in leadership development, Good. lead them down that path. Um, you know, have you have you heard of GLS? Have you been there before? What was your experience? If not, um, you know, we offer it. There's a discount, and aren't you interested in growing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, there's a lot that Marty just put in there, right? It's like finding the common ground. She did a lot of influence strategies in that one set of things. Um, so what's the common ground? Is leadership development a common ground? Ooh, great. Um, are you interested in faith-based leadership? Oh, this might be the perfect opportunity for it, which might be more like appealing to values, which is in the emotional piece. So see that we can start to pull lots of these as a way to begin to think about influencing others. Appealing to relationships is gaining cooperation with people we already know, right? And it's there's a lot in this one about reciprocity. We have to almost assume that there's reciprocity in the relationship for this one to work. And oftentimes this isn't a direct appeal as much as it is a suggestion or a question. Like, wow, wouldn't it be fun if we could go to GLS together and learn together and, right? So again, this is around people you already know and you're appealing to that relationship with them and they'll do it because it's like, yes, this relationship is important to me, okay? The other two approaches here, consulting um, and alliance building, um, are really based on understand, is getting into the other person's mind about what they think. 
It's really tapping into what they think as a way to influence, right? So consulting is very much about engaging others to give them some ownership to the solution. This is where questions, this is where our questions show up, okay? So this is the power of things like, um, uh, um, let's see, Scott McGowan, I'm gonna call on you because you're such a good question asker. What might be questions you would ask someone that would build their ownership to attending GLS if you were gonna use the consulting approach? Gosh, great question. You know, I've always heard that you, if you, when you ask a question, ask three questions behind the question. Okay. So if I was going to ask somebody that it might be, um, you know, hey, walk me through the last leadership experience that you had. Mm -hmm. right? So just kind of unpack that for me. Mm -hmm. And then inside of that answer, you might be able to find a nugget, right? Or something compelling to carry to the next one versus just kind of, um, throwing up uh, everything that you know. You're just trying to grab those nuggets from maybe a past experience from somebody. Great, great, right? So asking questions to really understand what is their thinking because that gives us more information to ask another question which might even get more deeply into their thinking and helps us know the ways in which we might navigate that. Beautiful, thank you, Scott. Uh, the last one here is alliance building. So this one is really interesting because it's very much built on social capital, let me say. It's wanting to be a part of, we influence because uh, it, this is an influence in, in referencing what others in the social group are doing, all right? So if I, if I were gonna influence, let's say <clears throat> my dear friend Wendy Roop is just not sure if she wants to come to this or not. And I say, Wendy, I was like, come on, Scott's going, I'm going, Kathy's going, Zach's going, Marty's going. <clears throat> it's gonna be so much fun, come on. Let's, that is alliance building, right? There's this peer pressure that kind of happens in alliance building. It's a way to say the group wants to do this, come along, come along, okay? So when we say it, we tap into what other people think. If we know that being parts of groups or what other people like to be a part of, this might be a way to get some cooperation or agreement. Wendy can always say no, right? This is, again, all of these are considered ethical because anyone, they could say no to this without real significant consequences or harm, harm being done. Okay, we're gonna go to the last one. The last, oh, again, what? Let me just go back here. Mark on here, which ones do you use? You know, look at your worksheet. Which ones do you think you really use more than others? Okay, the last one we're gonna to go to are um, emotional approaches. And these are all about tapping into inspiration, inspiration. And so I would posit that the majority of us who would say there has been an influential person in your life, different than somebody who used influence strategies with you, that an influential person in your life really demonstrated one of these two is what I would posit. Right, because this is about engaging our inspiration. So appealing to values, both of the emotional approaches, this is about appealing to the heart, right? Rational is appealing to the head, emotional is appealing to the heart. So appealing to values is connecting with something really deep inside of someone that they hold dear, right? So we make an emotional appeal to their heart because they hold so dear what's important around what we're offering up. So Kathy Glista, what would be an appeal to values for GLS? I because you can speak to this so eloquently because you already have. <laughs> and come off mute. Can I know? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the emotional appeal would be um, the change that it will make in your life, you know, by attending the GLS and um, exactly what you're going to gain from the experience for the next year and everything that you will learn. Yeah. Kathy, what do you hold dear about GLS? What does it tap into for you that's so important you wouldn't miss it? What taps into me is, is the internal value 
that it brings to me as a leader, but also what I can bring to other people, you know, through the GLS. So yeah. um, I think that's what, that's the best thing I could think of. That's beautiful. Thank you. All right. And then the last one we have here in terms of the ethical approaches is modeling, right? Um, and that, uh, especially in leadership roles, people are paying close attention to how we show up, how we act. Um, we, as leaders, as parents, as, as managers, as volunteers, uh, the way our behavior, whatever we're demonstrating our, our behavior is, is influencing, either positively or negatively and whether we choose it or not. But if we're very intentional about this, it means we're modeling and showing a way of thinking or a way of being with other people. And I know Wendy Roop has a very powerful story to share that I would like to turn it over to her for a minute uh, to be able to represent these here. So Wendy R. Sure, thanks, Anne. Yeah, when our, our team was talking about this and the importance of influence and stories, um, you know, it, the of course I've been very fortunate in my life to have many incredible people who have influenced at the end of 2019 and so of course he came to mind and he um really influenced me in my career always you know he was always cheering me on um kind of had similar backgrounds originally human resources and so forth but he was a very traditional guy and when he shared a tony robbins article with me several years ago and he told me, he just said, you'd be great at this. Like he had just written, you know, on this article and then he handed it to me and he said, you'd be great at this. And that in itself was life changing for me. And not that I needed his permission, um, you know, to, to go out and, and, and do that. But internally, I needed his permission um, to really just believe in myself and have his encouragement to really step into the truth of who I was, you know, who I was meant to be and what I was meant to do. And so he was a huge influence on what I'm doing today. And um, I don't think he knew it in the moment. We were talking about this earlier. You know, it's like he was intentional to say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to talk my daughter into being a coach. Um, but that's what he did because he was really appealing to the value of what he saw in me. And, um, and so, yeah, it, it's been uh, an incredible journey and I'm thankful that, um, you know, he, he influenced me in that way. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah. I'm so grateful for your dad for influencing you in that way. Thank <laughs> you, Anne. <laughs> All right. Okay. <clears throat> so take a look at those emotional approaches. See which, you know, do you lean on, do you lean on those kind of more heavily than others? Right. And we're going to quickly take a look at these that are considered the dark side. Be honest here about which ones you also use because we've all used them. I've used them. Scott's used them on me. I'm just kidding, Scott. <laughs> we, uh, especially under stress, especially under stress these influence techniques can rear their head. All right, so just also pay attention to these. Um, recognize that they're negative because they, the person on the other end perceives that it takes away their right to say no and that they have to say yes to something that is not in their best interest, okay? Um, so there are four here. Avoiding is the most common one. And here's how this looks. Um, we... The person who is trying to influence us, we don't want to tell them directly no. So what we do instead is we either say nothing or we say yes, and then we go outside of that room and complain to other people about it. Okay, that's what avoiding looks like. And so it may be that someone's they're trying to preserve harmony. Um, that can look like avoiding. Um, but this is essentially someone saying, I would prefer not to, but I'm not gonna tell you that I would prefer not to. So instead, I'm just gonna avoid and I'm gonna back channel, right? So that's what avoiding is. Um, 
Manipulation is creating an illusion of reality that is not true. It's withholding certain information. It's constructing a different uh, story about what's really happening. Um, it's, uh, it almost comes from this place of, there's a sucker here and I can take advantage of it, right? Kind of comes from that place. Intimidating is all rooted in winning. Okay. I'm going to win this. I'm going to deny your right to say no. And this is going to look like control and, and dominance as an influence strategy. And threatening is I'm going to make an offer that they can't refuse because I will imply imminent harm or consequences. Okay. So just take a minute and... <laughs> You're right, Marty. <laughs> Darth Vader, I think, probably did a lot of these, right? <laughs> In terms of I think the dark side, that, that whole regime kind of did these set of things. Um, in terms of trying to get people to do things. So just take a minute and do a, just a really honest and graceful self-assessment and just make a note of, do you find yourself leaning into any of these when you're under stress? I know my go-to is avoiding. That's the one I'll do. You know, it's really hard looking at these. Some of the <laughs> verbiage in these make you go, yikes. Yeah, <laughs> like you, you swallow hard, right, Jamie? It's like, ugh. I, I want to change some of the wording, even though I know exactly <laughs> what it is. So. <laughs> yeah, right. I did too. I was like, oh, is it really that? Can I call it something else? And it's like, I'd rather not have that. Maybe that means I'm going to avoid avoiding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great insight. Thank you. Okay. So here's what it just grab a piece of paper and I want you to be thinking about something here. Okay. Because once we kind of understand someone's self interest, which is what we focused on last month, and we understand that, then we can start to go, ah, given that these are the influence strategies that I think might make the most sense. And a lot of these are very intuitive based on people you know. Here's another premise that I want to offer to you <clears throat> the way that people try to influence us is a way they like to be influenced. The way that we notice somebody influencing us tells us information about how they want to be influenced. Okay, so when you look at these questions, I want you to really think about that. So think about someone you want to influence more effectively. And I would ask you to think about a specific situation that's coming up, right? Because influence is contextual. And I want you to just individually take a minute to answer these five questions. Right. So get a situation in mind.
And I would love for one person just to share their thinking, even if you haven't gotten through all of these, is there someone who's willing to come off and just share your, kind of share your responses to these questions? I can share in. Great. So my husband's on this Zoom. So John, <laughs> this is going to be fun. <laughs> so, uh, so what influence strategies do they tend to use and not use with you and others? So I would say John is more logical okay. and in his persuasion and it's more facts and um, talking about, you know, the, the good and the bad and, and weighing out those things. Um, whereas I'm more emotional and he doesn't use more of the emotional side of it. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll tend to only use emotional, which may not work all the time with him. Mm -hmm. And after us talking through, like, you know, we had our team meeting about it. Um, I realized this. So, uh, what does that tell you about how they might be influenced? So, um, so I found this patio furniture that I wanted to get. <laughs> I started talking to him about all the logical one, reasons one I chose. why we need that I this chose patio for you. Oh. Possibly officiate oh. Kathy, this girl right here. Okay. Is that, is that, you chose, I'm like, chose for what? I don't know who's talking. <laughs> I don't either. Oh. I'm muted. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so I started talking to him th then about all the logical reasons about, you know, why we need, you know, the old furniture is very old and, you know, that type of thing. And so I started using logical reasons with him about this. So uh, that's really three, two is what have you used, which ones have worked. And um, I don't know if it's worked yet. John, we'll have to talk later and see. <laughs> What different approaches I will try is, is the emotional one too, because it's, it's a thought of think of what we can, you know, we can sit on our back porch. You can have a cigar. I can have a glass of wine. We can, it'll be fun to have, you know, it'll be great for parties, uh, that type of thing. So that would be the other approach. Um, what would the approach look like in action? I think that's what I would, you know, those are the things that I would say. Um, what nonverbals would you express? That's what I wasn't sure about. If you could explain that, what nonverbals would I express? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, love example. I love it, right? Because, uh, you know, 7% of communication are words, the words we use, right? The other 93% are the way in which we use them and the, the way in which we, you know, kind of do, do I, do I want to sit next to this person when I'm having this conversation? Do I want to sit across from this person when I had in the conversation? Do I want to stand up? So John's sitting down while I have this conversation, you know, there are all these things we can think about that are more than just the words we express that signal to people. Am I with you in this? Um, are we, you know, are, is this, I'm, I, I'm really making a declaration because it's something that needs to happen and I want you to do it, which is more stating, you know, so all of those things, uh, the way in which we, uh, then express those things are going to be different. So that was why I just wanted you to consider it, Kathy, because there's such an important part of it. So I heard you also, you chose a social approach, which is appealing to your relationship with John. Um, and so I, I think it's rational. What's the data S appealing to relationship about what, you know, how much fun you could have there, and you know that he cares deeply about you and, and what you can do to enjoy together. Um, and then the values of appealing to values of gathering and community and, and, you know, we love that with each other. So, uh, Kathy, you, you right. I love it because now you're more inclusive of multiple approaches that may increase the likelihood I'm going to look at John's face, increase the likelihood that the patio furniture may come. <laughs> John, we would love to hear your reflections. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> See how much love there is there. When you have love, you can appeal to relationship. It's beautiful. All right. Kathy, thank you so much. So what we're going to encourage you to do is just take this set of questions and try them out. 
and, and play with other strategies that you might not use as often and see how it works for you. All right. So Scott, I think I'm turning it over to you, my friend. Wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. I'm trying to drive this on my, uh, on my phone. I'm in a hotel room in Cleveland and my Wi-Fi, so I'm gonna try to figure this out. And I've got these funky reading glasses that were stuck in the bottom of a briefcase. So um, I think probably that, you know, the best cure uh, for the soul is a quiet mind. And when I think of how we influence people, uh, for me specifically, I have to look at maybe potentially, am I selfish in that? So where in my life, maybe do I care more about myself than the other person? Am I self-seeking? And a lot of us have had this happen to us where we're influenced to do something and somebody else takes the credit for it. So am I self-seeking in that? Or am I dishonest? Am I telling somebody all the, all the truth about it? Am I, am I really being honest about that? And then ultimately, um, what am I afraid of? When I, when I can clean the deck chairs of those four things in my life, then I have a quiet mind and I have a quiet soul. Because um, truthfully, um, my past uh, in my life, Pace was a liar. Pace told me lies, big lies. Pace um, told me that the more I worked, the more I accumulated in stuff, the more successful I was. And it was a gigantic lie in my life. I had no chance to influence other people. I could barely influence myself. And <clears throat> I can remember, <laughs> Um, I sat down and I wrote this. Uh, when I was really young, I used to write poetry, but then society told me that boys weren't allowed to, to, to write poetry, so I stopped. So about 13 years ago, I got really involved back in that again. And I wrote this, I'm gonna read it to you. It, uh, the title of it is a, a Soft Pillow. And it says, I lay here alone with my prizes held high and think of the past with a tear in my eye. My, my life has been grand from the outside, you see. Why has the past been so dark to me? I gathered so much more than I could hold. What I realize now is that my soul had been sold. You see, I lay here myself all alone. It hurts so badly, my heart and soul moan. What I can't do for you is to give you your past. Unfortunately, in life, time does not last. Oh, I pray to go back, please, one more chance. To see your small face and smile while you dance. Why was I so blind when you asked me to play? And I looked at you and said, maybe another day. I stood there in flesh, but my heart was astray. If I could go back, I'd give it all away. My gift from above was you by my side. What a fool I was to push you aside. You're older now with children of your own. I pray every day you don't leave their hearts alone. Take time to hold them and share their dreams. Their little hearts aren't as, so aren't as small as they seem. My pillow was hard like my heart was then. Please listen to me for what I did was a sin. You don't have much time to ask God for grace. Don't do what I did and think life is a race. Give your heart to God and tie it with a bow. And may someday your head rest on a soft pillow. Now, I wrote that when my kids were younger. <clears throat> and by the grace of God, I got to repair a lot of that. And a quiet mind and a quiet soul helps you. And in the, in the shapes, too, when you go to the semicircle, we're encouraged to rest so we can work. And there's a beautiful book out. I love this book. It, the title of it is uh, The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. Uh, and, and if you get a chance to buy it, buy it, because it's really compelling. Um, and the little boy uh, says, isn't it odd? We can only see our, our outsides, but nearly everything happens on the inside. So, so that, that's really what Ann and Wendy and Kathy were talking about, is where are we emotionally? in regards to building uh, influence uh, in, our, in our lives. And it takes time. We have to work towards that. So in order to be really effective, and Jesus did this. So even in the heat of the battle and everything that he was doing, he took time to go pray. So he took time to rest. And we're encouraged to rest. Uh, and one of the things that Ann spoke about too a long time ago was the healthy mind platter. Remember that? And the value of sleep time. It's the only time that our brain has the ability to rewire and restore our mind. And I had no respect for sleep growing up, none. Matter of fact, I thought people that slept or took naps were lazy. What, a, what an arrogant, ignorant thought that is. Because it's not. When we get rest, we have, we have, we have, patient, we have more patience. Um, we have, uh, we're more quiet. 
we can maybe use our five senses a little deeper and a little more, um, uh, probably a little more intuitively. So it's really important. So the next slide. So influence requires thought and, and requires, it re requires our time. And so when we think about that, I love what, what Ian was speaking about too in regards to, hey, how does somebody else influence you? And potentially that's how they want to be influenced. And that's really powerful. And I can't wait for John to sit down with Kathy when we get off this call and say, let's just go buy that patio furniture. So if anyone's interested in patio furniture, join us to the next Provoke and, and we will do the same. <laughs> anyway, it's great. I love John. I love Kathy. I love you both. And it was awesome. But you, you have to spend time in building your approach. So, you know, wh where would that be? Is it more rational? Is it social? Is it, is it emotional? And tight, and you've got to maybe take time to explore that in, in grace and in truth and how we're talking to people about that. And I love the invitation challenge when we talk about grace without truth is meaningless. Truth without grace is mean. And, but when we spend time putting that together uh, and maybe even uh, writing some notes down to make sure that we don't forget what we're, the, the target that we're aiming towards, it can all, uh, it, can, uh, it can help us. And then lastly, just time to explore the, uh, the circle and um, where can we observe, reflect, discuss in our lives when we attempt to move forward and do this? Because there's no question when we're more intentional about this, there's no question we can have more influence, but we, we're also gonna make a ton of mistakes. So how do we, you know, how do we learn uh, from, uh, from this? Influence has affected everybody on this call. Everybody in this call has been influenced by somebody in their heart. And this week is National Teacher Week. Um, and I had a third grade teacher. Her name was Mrs. Gardecki. And she was, uh, those of you uh, that are older might remember this name. If you're younger, you have no idea who this is. But the na her name was Doris Day, and she was an actress. And my third grade teacher, Mrs. Gardecki, looked just like that. And I never did my homework and I never turned it in. And I never liked going to school. Uh, I didn't like it. And Mrs. Gardecki came up to me one day and um, she put her hand on my shoulder. I'll never forget this. And she said, can you help me? And because back then, looking back, I probably didn't have a lot of respect for myself, but I had respect for Mrs. Gardecki. Uh, probably because I was a boy and she was pretty. <laughs> but... I had respect for her. And she said, hey, Scott, we, we're having this contest in our school. The teacher that gets the most homework turned in by students wins a prize. And I was like, wow. And she said, can you help me win that prize? And I was like, sure. So I went home that night. I did my homework and I turned it in. And the next day I turned it in. The next day I turned it in. I was real excited about going in. Gosh, and I'm getting emotional I'm talking about this, but I was real excited about going in and handing that to Mrs. Gardecki and watching her uh, smile. But an uncanny thing happened, and I think she knew this from the very beginning, is after about two weeks, I really enjoyed doing my homework. And I enjoyed smiling back. And it was probably the most influential um, tap on the shoulder that I got was from Mrs. Gardecki. And all of you have been influenced by somebody in your lives. And what we're really encouraging to do as we leave here today is we need some stories. People believe and they get attached to stories in really big ways. And what's even the most uh, amazing about the human condition is people want to be part of a story. So when you're telling a story and, and it's compelling and it's interesting and it's, and it's heartfelt, what, what's interesting, most people want to, they, they want to jump in that chapter. They want to be a part of the next chapter. They, they want to be a part of that. So what we want to do is we, we, we want to tell stories. So if you've got a story, uh, and you can tell it. I would love to hear your story. So in the next 30 days, I've got my email address here. It's horribly long. <laughs> um, it's psmcgowan at mcgowanbrevener.com. If you could send me uh, maybe some stories about how you've influenced people over the last 30 days, we'd love to put that out on, on Provoke and be able to just tell, uh, tell some stories. So we are right at 8 a.m. and we are right on time. I'd like to really thank Hannah for joining us today. So thanks for getting up early and, and, uh, and joining us. I hope this was useful. Um, Hannah, I might, before we leave, do you have any questions for Provoke or anything you'd like to say or add before we leave? 
Hey, thank you so much. That was really, that was super helpful. I can see the, the value and, and why Provoke has continued on um, for so many years. Um, you've been doing this for, since about 2017, right? Yep. Okay. No, I don't have any but, questions. Well, perfect. Well, thanks for joining us uh, for sure. And hopefully, um, yeah, hey, Hannah, I'll make a deal. If you want to go to GLS, I'll buy your ticket. So if you're interested in doing that, okay. you're going to love it. It's in August. All you do is just send me an email. I'll let you and, uh, and let me know. Cool. All right. Great. Thank Excellent. you guys so much. Well, today is May 4th. And as Marty said, may the 4th be with you. Um, and, uh, and tomorrow is May 5th and in my grandson's fifth birthday. So I'm really excited about that. And then join us next time on June 7th, 7 a.m. Provoke, uh, and have an amazing blessed day. And thanks for influencing me. Take care. Bye everybody. Have a great day. Bye.